In the early 90s, Tom Cruise was at a bit of a crossroads in his career. As he approached 30, the time was fast coming when he could no longer play the kind of young, cool guy roles that made his 80s movies such huge successes. Indeed, the formula was already starting to wear thin, with his Days of Thunder underperforming at the US box office. His follow-up, Far and Away, performed even worse, landing with a thud at the North American box office, despite it reteaming Cruise with his now wife Nicole Kidman, whose career was starting to take off, and the fact that it was directed by Ron Howard. It really was time for Cruise to tweak the kind of movies he was making, and sure enough, his next film, A Few Good Men, would kick off a streak of five back-to-back -back $100 million hits, which would make him the most bankable star in the world. Now, A Few Good Men was based on a play by Aaron Sorkin, who at the time was a complete unknown. Sorkin's sister was a lawyer for the US Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps, better known now, thanks largely to this movie, as the JAG Corp. His sister told him about a case that involved a group of Marines on trial after a hazing, aka a code red, was ordered by a superior officer and almost resulted in the death of a fellow Marine. Of the 10 Marines accused of the crime, seven would accept a plea deal that called for their immediate dishonorable discharge. Three would elect to go to trial, ending in all three of them being cleared. Sorkin would dramatize the event significantly with the violent hazing resulting in a death and only two Marines being involved, with both of them electing to go to trial. The play immediately sold to producer David Brown, who was one of the original producers on Jaws, and he partnered with Rob Reiner's Castle Rock to make the film. Reiner was much in demand as a director at the time, having made This Is Spinal Tap, The Sure Thing, Stand By Me, and When Harry Met Sally. When he opted to direct the film, Sorkin was allowed to adapt his own play, although despite receiving sole screenplay credit, famed writer William Goldman apparently made some changes which Sorkin liked so much that he ended up including them in all future stagings of his original play. In the lead, Daniel Caffey, who was a sharp-tongued JAG attorney who specializes in plea deals for his clients without having to go to trial, Tom Cruise was the first and only choice. While Days of Thunder and Far and Away might not really have worked, Cruise was also coming off of Rain Man and Born on the Fourth of July just a few years earlier, meaning his acting bona fides were rock solid. The script, paired with Reiner's reputation as a director, made the movie a hot property, meaning that they were able to assemble a star-packed dream cast that would include people that were leading their own movies at the time and supporting roles. Both Kiefer Sutherland and Kevin Bacon were pretty big stars in the early 90s. They could have arguably been up for the Caffey role, but they opted to play smaller roles, with Sutherland the sadistic second lieutenant Kendrick, who participates in the cover-up, while Bacon would play opposing counsel, Captain Jack Ross. Demi Moore, who had done Ghosts not long before, would play Lieutenant Commander Joanne Galloway, co-counsel for Caffey and his superior officer. This led to the studio TriStar demanding that Sorkin write a sex scene for Cruz and Moore, claiming that there was no point in casting Moore if she wasn't going to sleep with Cruz in the movie. Sorkin bristled at the studio note and was backed by Reiner, who thought the idea was asinine, which it was. Kevin Pollack, then mostly known as a comedian, would play Caffey's best friend and the movie's conscience, Lieutenant Sam Weinberg, while the rest of the cast would include up-and-comers like Cuba Gooding Jr. and Noah Wiley, as the two accused Marines, Reiner cast James Marshall, who was then best known for Twin Peaks as PFC Luden Downey. Interestingly, Reiner would actually cast his own assistant, a non-actor named Wolfgang Bodinson, as Lance Corporal Dawson, and indeed, the non-actor delivered an electrifying performance. Noted character actor J.T. Welsh would play the conscience-plagued Lieutenant Colonel Markinson, leading to him becoming much in demand over the years to come before his tragic death in 1998. Of everyone though, the biggest casting coup without a doubt was Jack Nicholson, who would play the movie's antagonist, Colonel Nathan R. Jessup. Nicholson was actually not the first choice for the role, with Gene Hackman passing on it to do his own Oscar-winning turn in Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven. He would actually team with Cruise the next year on The Firm, which just might become another episode of Tom Cruise Revisited in the near future. James Woods was another possibility, but in the end, Nicholson was paid a whopping $5 million for only 10 days' work, but considering how the movie turned out, I think they got their money's worth. Watching A Few Good Men now, it's easy to see why the film was such a sensation when it came out. It works as both an electrifying piece of entertainment and as a prestige drama. Cruise is amazing as the cocky Caffey, perfectly cast, who just wants to serve enough time as a jag in order to set up a career in private practice and would rather just stay out of the courtroom entirely. 
he's challenged by Morris Galloway, as well as the fact that both of his clients would simply rather fight it out in order to prevent being discharged from the military. He finds himself up against the establishment with Nicholson's venal Jessup, a career officer, on his way to a high-profile slot in the cabinet. But he has a sadistic streak a mile long. Here's the thing, though. The movie was celebrated in 1992 for the fireworks between Nicholson and Cruz that happened on camera. And Nicholson is great, to a point. I do find, revisiting this movie, that he struggles a little bit with Sorkin's dialogue at the very end. But, like most others in the cast, it kind of comes off as stagey in a way that Sorkin's dialogue often does. That's why I really do think that Tom Cruise, and maybe J.T. Walsh to a certain extent, really walks away with the movie, as he's so damn cocky that you buy him speaking in that classic Sorkin way, and he almost makes the pages and pages of dialogue seem naturalistic. They're like butter. The same thing goes for Walsh, who delivers a quiet performance that's the opposite of Nicholson's, but maybe has even greater impact, especially considering his final scene and the fact that he died just a few years later. It gives the movie a bit more of an impact. All in all, A Few Good Men was a blockbuster for all involved, with it earning a mighty $141 million in the US, which is pretty amazing for a talky courtroom drama, plus another cool $100 million overseas. It walked away with five Oscar nominations, but no wins and has gone on to be seen as a classic in the filmographies of all involved. One of its most long-lasting legacies has been how it led to the creation of the long-running CBS legal drama JAG, with the moniker being popularized in the movie's wake, while Sorkin went on to the West Wing and a career as one of the most in-demand writers in Hollywood. Sorkin and Ryder would reunite for The American President just a few years later. For Cruz, it would be the movie he needed to take him out of that babyface Maverick-style role to his next level and it would lead probably to his greatest phase of stardom, which of course we're going to examine here on Tom Cruise Revisited.